Testing the Fruit of the Seed Sown. That's the name of today's sermon. It's going to be a very detailed study in the scriptures focused on the parable of the seed and the sower. Now, there's been a lot of debate over the years about this parable. Is it, it describes four different types of seed that are sown, four different types of people, in other words, that hear the word of God and what they do with it. And the debate comes in of how many of these different types of seed are describing uh, saved people versus lost people versus false converts, whatever. And I say false converts as kind of a third group because if you know anything at all about uh, New Testament Christianity, there's a lot of false converts out there and they can appear to be genuine conversions until later on. We're going to talk about that in the study today. So let's start out in Isaiah, back in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. It's always important to have a King James Bible with you so that you can make sure that I'm telling you the truth. Don't just uh, listen in and whatever else. I realize that there are people listening to me while they're working, as I've said many times, and that's okay, I get it, but make sure that you always go back to the scriptures. The scriptures are your final authority. Don't ever trust a preacher that doesn't hold a Bible in his hands and that doesn't tell you to turn in your Bible in your hands. Don't ever trust one. Oh, well, we live in a modern day of technology and everything else, so we just post the scriptures up on the, the screen and whatever else. No. That's not Bible-believing Christianity. Bible-believing Christianity is having a paper copy of this blessed book here, this King James Bible, the King James Version, authorized version as it was originally called. You have a paper copy in front of you, not digital because digital can be changed. The paper cannot. In spite of the whole supposed Mandela effect, the Word of God has never been changed. I've proved that. Um, you have to have a paper copy. Always make sure you go back to the scriptures. Isaiah 55, chapter 55, and we will begin in verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Call upon goes along with seeking. Okay, there's a lot of heretics out there that say there's no salvation um, if you call, ask the Lord to save you. It's just all mental belief. That's Gnosticism. Robert Breaker teaches it. Uh, there's a bunch of guys that teach it out there that are very popular, quote unquote. Um, and they teach Gnosticism is all that they're teaching. You imagine that you're saved because you imagine, you know, that Jesus died on the cross and I believe it in my mind and whatever. And you don't have to actually ask God to save you. That's nonsense. It's all through scripture. You contact the Lord. You call upon the Lord. Obviously, if you want to come and see me, or something, you want to come and, and say something, I have something for sale and you'd like to come and, and buy it or whatever, you want to, you have to get in contact with me. Call me, okay? Pretty easy to figure that out. Verse seven, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Salvation has always been about a changed life. You're changing your attitude, changing your mind towards your life of sin. Otherwise, there's no point in getting saved. I just want to continue this, this life. Jesus had to die on the cross to pay for the sins that I'm doing, but I just want to continue that. It doesn't make any sense. Verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I would never worship a God that is on my intellectual level or on the intellectual level of anybody else out there in this wicked world. I want him to think differently than I think. I want him to think differently than the religious leaders out there think. That's why you have to call upon him and say, God, I believe your word. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, but I'd like you to save me. I don't know what all it means to live for you, but I'll do whatever you want me to do. I give you my life. Please save me. It's so simple. So simple. But the false prophets have to come along and they know that if they can tweak the gospel just a little bit, they can get you. And there's a lot of people out there that are end up as false converts. We'll be talking about that with this study. Verse 10, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Huh. Watereth the earth, 
rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, a lot of snow out here right now, it's pretty bright. You can kind of see the reflection on the window over there. It's very bright out there. We've been getting some good snow now um, here in northern Maine. Um, and returneth not thither. It doesn't go back up again. But watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. This book right here, we'll see this in the next verse. This book right here is, you know, it talks about in Ephesians chapter 5 about a husband, you know, cleansing his wife and purifying her with the washing of water by the word. This book can make you clean. It can clean up your life. You know, a lot of people out there, they, they see a preacher like me and they say, oh, look at Mr. Goody Two Shoes era. He doesn't drink and he doesn't smoke and he doesn't do drugs. doesn't listen to rock music. He doesn't use profanity. Oh, what's such a clean guy? Yeah, but you're forgetting the fact that I'm washed. You're looking at me as a dirty, filthy sinner and you're looking at somebody that's washed and saying, oh, you smell so nice. Why don't you live like the rest of us and stink? Uh, well, are you still? You're forgetting that fact. I used to listen to the rock music. I didn't do drugs. You know, I didn't really, I smoked once and it was terrible, you know, didn't really drink or anything, but yeah, I did a bunch of other wicked, perverted things, a bunch of wicked, stupid, sinful, you know, life choices that really were hurting me. Yeah. You need to be cleaned up. This book will do it for you. Here's the tie in verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Um, you can't waste your time preaching this book. Did you know that? You can't waste your time putting out gospel tracts. It has the word of God on it. Go put it out there. Lord says, hey, go put one in there. Hey, put one over in this store there. Put one on that park bench over there. Put that. There's a bus stop over there. There's a bunch of things over there you can put there. Go into a bookstore and pick up, a, go to the occult section and pick out occult books and just have the tracks in this hand, put them underneath the back of the book. Nobody's looking, slip it right in, close the book. I don't think I'm interested in that book. <laughs> There's all kinds of ways that you can get the Word of God out there and publish it. I've shown that stuff for years. Just print up a little you know, business card size uh, track with some scriptures on it and just have a good time going to the beer section at your local grocery store and the little hand cut out thing on the side of the case of the beer, slip it right in there. If it has God's word on it, it will not return unto him void. He'll accomplish something with that word. It's either judgment or salvation. You can't fail. As a Christian, it is not your job to lead people to Jesus Christ the whole way through. And just, I, I got that person saved. That's my convert, and that's my convert, and that's my convert. That's Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism goes out and makes converts of people. You know what our job is according to the New Testament? Sowing seeds, planting seeds. And if their seeds already been sown in somebody, you go and you water it. God gives the increase. Oh no, uh, brother, you have to lead at least 20 people to the Lord every week or else you're not a very good Christian. That's nonsense. You know what that is? That's sales techniques that to fill up Baptist pews, to pay off Baptist mortgages, to buy bigger Baptist buildings. That's what that is. Look at the soul winning movement. Look where it came from. That's what it is. It's marketing. It's sales. That's all that it is. It's not New Testament salvation. He that winneth souls is wise. We're to be soul winners. He that when his souls is wise has nothing to do with preaching the gospel. It just means you have a winning personality. I'm a, I'm a soul winning type of a guy. I mean, think about it. It's written in the Old Testament. It's in Proverbs. King Solomon was the one that God inspired to write that verse. He wasn't going out and, you know, knocking on doors, inviting people to church or something. That stuff is nonsense. I have a whole study on hyper soul winning, the dangers of hyper soul winning, if you want to see about that. That's not sowing seed. All right, sowing seed is this book, getting this book out, not your polished little go to door to door, knock on the door, you know, like that. And they open the door. You say, and they stick their head out and you say, uh, hello, I'm uh, here today to talk to you about salvation or, or, um, Oh, I was just wondering, I'm out here today asking people if they died today, do they know for sure where they would go? And about that time, you know, no, I'm not inter interested. <laughs> you, 
let me, let me, let me just, if I could just have another moment of your time. It, and I've been through that stuff. I've seen how many people and they just, you know, you get there and they're going, you get the people that are polite, you know, and, and they don't want to tell you to go away right away. And, and they'll just stand there and they'll listen. They'll say, well, that's really interesting. And you know, I, I just, I'm not really interested in you. Know, yes, but you know, you're trained to keep it going and keep it going. And I've seen people and I've known of people that have literally just, okay, what do I need to do to get, you know, you off my porch, but to get saved, you know, and they'll pray a prayer or they'll do whatever they have. Well, yeah, I'll come to your church. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. Go away. I, I have things to do here. It's Saturday. It's my day off. I'm a soul winner. I've gone out and I've led thousands to the Lord. Uh, where are they at? Have their lives changed? No. And we'll see that in this study today. The danger of uh, going out and sowing um, false seed. Say it that way. Your own words, in other words. This is the seed that needs to be sown. Verse 12, for ye shall go out with joy. <laughs> Do you go out knocking doors and things? Is that joy? It was duty, you know, back when I was going to the Baptist church system. And a lot of the other churches, well, they don't even bother going out. You know, they just do spaghetti suppers and whatever and invite people over for clothing swaps or something. You know, uh, there wasn't much joy. I was doing it to prove that I was a good Baptist in good standing, you know. Yeah. Um, for you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorns shall come up the fir tree. Fir tree is a picture of the Lord, by the way, in the Bible. It's a whole other study. And instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Hmm. When you get into an actual witnessing situation, you'll have joy when you're done. When the Lord actually sets it up and you go in and it's some kind of a thing where somebody says, they're standing there and they say, I just don't know what's going on about this world. Do you understand what's going on? And, and you know, I, I don't know. Or they see your bank and they say, I don't know what to believe about this Bible stuff. Do you, are you a Christian? And boy, the Holy Spirit just goes, just almost like he's inside your body, squeezing your lungs saying, talk, <laughs> you know, and you just, it just flows and you're so excited and you're just bubbling over and, and yeah, you know, I, I mean, I was, I, you wouldn't believe the guy I was before I got saved and, and the Lord saved me and, and you know what, the Bible is your authority and, and you just get to witness to somebody when the Lord sets it up, when it's not you and it's amazing. It's a wonderful thing. I've had, you know, a lot of those over the years and things, but, you know, to go out and try to force it or something, and I'm just sowing seeds whether people like it or not. I'm just going to witness to them and, you know, here's the gospel whether you like it or not, you know. Uh, that's not the right way to do it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Now we'll actually get into the parable of the seed and the sower. And, you know, the pressure that's put on people, you know, uh, when's the last time you won somebody to Jesus Christ? When's the last time you witnessed? Are you a soul winner? You know? Uh, well, our Baptist pastor might be, you know, fooling around with another woman, but he's a soul winner. You know? <laughs> okay. Uh, I remember Jack Hiles. There was some guy in his church, his giant cult that he had, and the guy was a, a soul winning, great soul winner, and he was did bus ministry and all kinds of other stuff. I mean, he got convicted for pedophilia, you know, and molested a child or two on the bus route, but you know, he was a soul winner, you know, <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> well, he got a lot of people to pray decisions. He, you know, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you've never heard the gospel for the first time, I want you to pray this prayer after me, repeat after me. And they do this whole thing and they get, you know, and they'll get done and they'll say, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, raise your hand. And the people raise their hands. If you've, you know, Prayed it before, but you weren't sincere. Raise your hand. <laughs> and they'll do this thing, and they'll do a head count. Okay. 35 people on the bus. I got 35 people saved. You know, a total scam. And I've talked to people that were there that knew about it. And I remember the one guy, he was actually going to Hiles Anderson College, and he said he was literally uh, in one of these bus ministry things, 
And I think it was something like 75 people or whatever else that made decisions. And he goes to church, I think the next week or something or that later that day. I forget the whole, how the whole thing was. But he goes and he said, literally, Jack Hiles took credit for the children that were saved on the bus. And he wasn't even there. <laughs> you know? I've had, you know, so many hundreds of people saved in the meeting. I had 75 on the bus and over miss away and everything, you know, and there's three or four guys taking credit for, you know, I had 75 people saved. Yeah, I got 75 people, led 75 people to the Lord this, this morning on the school bus. <sighs> what a bunch of nonsense. Matthew chapter 13. We'll go down through here. Verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some in hundred, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. I'll just stop there for just one minute. Um, how many of the different types of seed went on to produce fruit? Just one. That will be important later. Um, the word fruit there only appears in um, verse 8, brought forth fruit. Okay, let's continue. Verse 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall, ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. You know, it's a very interesting thing because right here at this very office, I have right there on that banner in the window facing the street, Hebrews 9.27. And as it, is it appointed unto men, uh, and as it is uh, appointed unto men, one, I'm having to read it backwards, once to die, but after this the judgment. Then Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1.7 on the next one. And the third one, Psalm 14, verse 1, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Um, corrupt are they. Uh, yeah. No, I'm, uh, there's no God. Um, they are corrupt. Uh, they have done abominable. Man, it's so hard to read backwards. <laughs> They're, oh, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Sorry, I'm not very good at reading backwards and through the back of the banner. And you know what? I see people walking by here and they won't even look. They'll, they'll see the banners and they go, just, you know, like it's some kind of a, you look here and you die or something. I mean, this is so terrible. Um, the Lord, they were there in the Lord's day. And the Lord looked at those people and he said, no, uh, my word is not for you. Sorry, no. Um, you're not going to get it. The Lord did that. The Lord didn't say, well, you know, hey, there are souls that need to be saved. I mean, hey, I'm just going to go out there. I'm going to preach the gospel to these people. I mean, I'm going to be the greatest soul winner that's ever been here on the earth. I mean, think about that. Um, did the Lord ever go door to door? Did the Lord ever have a bus ministry? Did the Lord ever just pressure people into salvation? You realize how many people the Lord just didn't even bother witnessing to them? The Lord, Jesus Christ, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
God manifest in the flesh. And he just let a whole bunch of people just, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to speak plainly to them. They don't deserve it. Always remember that. Because there are people out there that will try to pressure you into some system of soul winning and whatever else, which is completely unscriptural. And they'll put pressure on you because you're not a very good soul winner. Remember that. Verse 16, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Blessed are your eyes. You're watching this. You're looking at the scriptures, looking them up for yourself and your ears are hearing what I'm saying. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. You know, Many, what's it say there, prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things. I remember reading of, of the book about D.L. Moody by his, and his, you know, by his son. It was written in 1899 was when it was published. And um, I have a copy of it, an original copy. And I remember the greatest sorrow of his life was that he was not part of the end times group of people. He was desperately wanted to see the catching up of the body of Christ. He was looking forward to it. But he went over to Jerusalem, over there to Israel, and there was no nation of Israel in his day. And it grieved him. And he thought, I could have only been here, been alive to see the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Then I might have been caught up. And he loved the Lord and he did great things for the Lord, but he just, ah. Uh. Think about that, brethren. Verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see. I know it was talking in context about Jesus being on the earth. But we're living in the end times when Jesus is going to be catching up the body of Christ. And have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. We're seeing and hearing the fulfilling of the scriptures. And yet how many people even care? Central Bank Digital Currencies announced now here in America. Federal Reserve, I think on Wednesday or something like this, they came out and they said, here you go. We're going to introduce the new central bank digital currencies. And people are saying, I wonder where this is going to lead. I don't know where it's going to lead. Well, I don't know. Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18, Mark of the Beast. Carrying on into, into chapter 14, that talks about verses 9 through 11. What happens if you take the mark and worship the beast in his image? I just can't imagine where it's heading. Oh, uh, they've closed their eyes. They've closed their ears. I've been here the whole time. Other preachers and things have been around warning people. We're getting closer to the mark of the beast. Go down to the grocery store, go to the store, go to the gas station, go to the, this place there, look at the scanners. Got a little implantable microchip now in your card, your debit card. Didn't have that in the past. Didn't have a debit card when I was little. Everything was cash. But we have to go cashless. I think it's heading towards good times. You're a fool. Verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was, which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some in hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. All right. Now, a lot of people will say groups one and two. The uh, um, verse one in their uh, nineteen chapter, verse nineteen. The one that receives seed by the wayside. Okay, they say, well, that's obviously a false convert. They hear it and then it doesn't really sink in. They don't do anything with it. I think we could all agree to that unless you're some ultra liberal, you know, Gnostic or something. Well, as long as he believed, then he's saved and it doesn't matter what he does from there. 
whatever. Bye bye. You need to get saved yourself. So, you know, sorry to the Gnostics. Then the next group is in verse 20 to 21, where you have he that received seed into stony places, the stony ground here, right? And again, I don't think many people that are saved would argue with the fact that, you know, um, somebody that receives stone, the seed into stony ground, they're not saved. They have no root. It's just all in themselves. There's no actual genuine conversion. Okay? Again, the first two there, the uh, wayside here and the stony ground, um, one there, uh, they're both lost. Okay? I think we could agree on that if we're saved. The debate comes, and of course, you know, verse 23, the one that bears fruit, well, obviously they're saved. The debate is in verse 22. All right? Somebody can... And here's how the argument goes if you're kind of the modern Christian mindset or whatever else. Well, somebody gets saved, but then they get carnal because they're going with the uh, care of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and it chokes the word and they become unfruitful. See, they're saved, but they're just not producing fruit. Well, that's a problem, okay? Because I understand that a Christian, and we will be looking at the scriptures here in a little bit, I understand that the Christian can become unfruitful. We can get messed up and we you know, aren't bearing as much fruit and whatever else. But you see, that's factored into verse 23. Bringeth forth some in hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So if you want to make the argument for a carnal Christian, you can say thirty. A on-fire Christian would be one hundredfold. Okay, and somebody who's mediocre would be sixty. All right? So you can't say, well, no, you can be a Christian and not bear any fruit. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a big problem, right? And if you remember, compare spiritual things with spiritual. If you take the four here and you compare it over to what Jesus was saying, um, you know, it doesn't say anything about they produce fruit over in verse 7. If 22, you know, becometh unfruitful, there was fruit there and then they just became unfruitful after a while because they got carnal, then it would say something, something about fruit, that they bore fruit in verse 7. There's nothing there. And when you compare this one in Matthew 13 to the ones in Mark 4 and Luke 8, you will see that there's no such thing as this thing of, well, the third group there, um, the one that's, you know, basically the, where the, the word is choked, um, they're saved, they're just not producing enough fruit. They're, you know, it's just carnal or something. That's not there. I'm going to show you. Like I said, this is going to be a big study. All right? This is another one of those studies that I've been wanting to do for a long time. It's, there's a lot of scriptures to go over. Okay. Now, let's continue here. Um, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So in other words, the good there, the good seed is producing fruit, but the tares are there. And here's the point, okay, about the thing of can a false convert make some kind of, you know, make it look like they're producing fruit. That's why we're continuing to read this. Um, verse 27, So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst, thou, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in, in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Hmm. That is a picture of the resurrection, a picture of the catching up of the body of Christ, some call the rapture. That's what's going to be happening there. All right. It's an interesting thing. Now, of course, you can really make the doctrinal application when you have the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25, Jesus separating the sheep and the goats. Sure. Absolutely. But there's also the spiritual application there to the body of Christ. You have a lot of false converts. Well, what, how do you sort them out? Or when the catching up happens? The saved are going up, and the lost are staying. And how do you determine the ones that produce fruit? You see, the good ones, the real ones. 
It's very important. You know, there's a, a stupid bunch of nonsense people say, well, you shouldn't judge uh, fruit or whatever else. Oh, you have to judge fruit. Okay? Um, if you learn anything at all about uh, foraging for wild edibles, you need to judge uh, plants by the fruit that they produce. You don't just go out and say, I think this one should work out good. I'll just try to eat this one or something. I mean, one of the most recognizable uh, wild edibles is a raspberry. There aren't very many lookalikes to a raspberry. Blueberries, I've seen blue type berry things and they're not actual edible blueberries. But raspberries, they pretty much like, look like raspberries, okay? And um, you can tell the plant by the fruit. You inspect the fruit. Very important. Mark chapter four, Mark chapter four, turn to Mark chapter four. Let me just do something here real quickly. All right. My, uh, okay. My, um, yeah. My camera's plugged into a little battery pack thing. It was sitting up there in the sunlight and it's getting overheated. So, much like a lot of my viewers, they get overheated too. Uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 1 through 20. And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there, were get, there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea of, on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. <laughs> and some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Yielded no fruit. It wasn't that it was unfruitful. Remember that. Another, field, another fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked, him of, asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables. That seeing they might they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. <laughs> I mean, what a statement. Um, you know, I don't want these people to, to hear what I'm saying because I don't want to forgive their sins or convert them. Uh, can you imagine saying that around a, a lot of the soul winning types of yeah, I pick on the Baptists a lot because they're one of the few that actually talks about going out and winning souls and whatever else. Uh, I don't want to talk to these people because they might actually get converted and get saved and their sins would be forgiven. So I, I really don't want to talk to people. <laughs> Jesus said it right there in the text. Hmm. You think maybe that the salvation could be something else other than this just, I made a profession and I just go and live in my life. You think the Lord might actually require some other things of you? I'm not talking about before you get saved and someday you get you know you do enough good works and then you eventually get saved. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you come truly broken as a sinner and the Lord says, okay, I'm going to take you and I'm going to bury you with me, planted, and then you come up and you start to produce fruit. Your old man dies, gets buried, and you are born again. Rise up as a new creature. I had no plans to be a preacher when I was a, a young man. I trained to be a motorcycle mechanic. I wanted to ride and race motorcycles. And then later on, I wanted to be a professional wood turner, an artist. I did that for a number of years, exhibited in, in art galleries across the country, went to art shows and things like that. I didn't want to be a preacher. Are you kidding me? But you see, that old Brian died and God buried him. And he's dead and he's gone. He's never coming back. And a new Brian grew up out of that soil. 
and the Lord watered it. And here I am, a preacher all these years later. Don't tell me you don't have to change after you get saved. That's nonsense. I mean, that's the whole point of salvation, a change in your life. You know, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. The old hymn goes. Verse 13, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts by having them watch other YouTube videos. <laughs> Had to add that in there. It's not in the scriptures, but I'm, I'm just trying to be sarcastic here. Um, how many times have people seen my videos or other videos out there and it makes them start to think about uh, salvation and about eternity and they think, wow, maybe there is a God and maybe this Bible is his word. And, and Oh, look at that video. That looks funny. A kitty cat riding on a bicycle. Wow. Oh, there's a, a monkey on a surfboard. Um, I never did understand the history of the first man who created the rubber band or something. And you go on the old YouTube trail and you're pretty soon you're watching some guy ride a mountain bike over a frozen glacier or something. How did it go from this to that? You see? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. You start out having some fear because you lost a lot on the stock market and because you're looking at if there could be some fuel shortages and that could lead to the destruction of the country and there could be World War III and they're doing the, you know, commercials, what happens if New York City gets nuked and you're looking at this and you're looking at that and this, all the other stuff that's going on in the world, you're looking at that and all of a sudden, what was the thing about that, you know, you, you go and you're looking up how to be saved and, and things and then the devil just, completely diverts you and you're off watching something else. That's how it happens. And I realize I'm sowing a lot of seed there uh, by the wayside. Okay. Uh, YouTube, it should be called a wayside tube.com. Uh, there's a lot of seed that's sown. I get out there and I put the word of God out and the devil just comes along and just plucks it right out of people's minds. They go off and they watch something else. Verse 16, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Oh, that was a good video. I'm favoring, favoriting it. I'm giving it a thumbs up. And I really like that video. It was a good video. But is it going to stick? Are you going to change your life? Are you actually going to get saved? Come to the Lord and call upon Him to be saved? Believe what the Bible says about Him? Believe what the Bible says about you, sinner? Are you going to believe that? Are you going to let this book rip you to shreds and convict you and make you cry? Are you going to let this book ruin your family and your friends and have people turn against you? Are you going to do that? Well, I don't... Mm -hmm. Verse 17... And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. <laughs> um, that could be called the motto of my, this ministry or something. Maybe not the motto, but um, the thing I've discovered more than anything else. I cannot tell you how many people were once being blessed by this ministry and blessed and they're learning the word, they're reading the word, they're, they're coming to all kinds of truth. And all of a sudden I say something wrong or whatever else, you know, sometimes it is my fault. Sometimes I don't say things correctly. Other times it's just, I preach the word and they get offended by it, but pew, off they go. And the next thing I know they're using profanity. They're getting drunk. They're just, I'm done. I was part of the Denlinger cult. I'm finished now and I'm back to watching television and I can do all this other stuff, all this wicked stuff. Just whoosh, right back to the world. 180 degree turn, boom, right back to the world. Why? Because it was all up here. There are professors that study my work, that show my videos to their students just to, so that they can sit there and laugh at me and make fun of me. I've had psychiatrists watching my stuff. 
I've had military goons watching my stuff, people, Jesuits and whatever else. They're all watching my stuff just to see what's the, how's he say this and how's he so we can take the same thing and spin it and twist it. And it. I'm sowing the word. I'm trying to do my part. But a lot of it doesn't come back. Verse 18, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, you're watching the video, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, three different things, uh, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Again, very similar to the thing of the seed sown by the wayside. The devil uses those three things, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, he'll use those things and he'll get you, he'll pull you back in. And they become unfruitful and they just wither and die. They don't do anything. Again, I've seen that. I've seen people, they're doing great. And I say, you know, try to do this, you know. I, I mean, the Lord's a gentleman. He's, you know, he's not going to just force you to do everything right, right away. God has grace. He's long-suffering. He's merciful, ready to forgive, and the whole thing. Praise the Lord. Very patient with us. But there are certain things you need to get kind of sanctified and get it out of your life. Because there's going to keep you from producing fruit as a Christian. There are some things that you need to do. Okay? But I've seen some people, and they get to messing around and whatever else, and they don't take my advice, they don't listen. You know, and I'm giving you the advice of the Scriptures. It's not just my opinions. And off they go. There's no fruit produced. I've seen that too. Verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as, bear, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. You know, this book, if you truly believe this book, it'll turn you into a fanatic. Why? Because this book says that we're living in the end times. And these people, they don't know it. They don't know it. They're driving by out here on the road. You can hear them maybe a little bit in the microphone here and thing. They don't know. They have no idea what's coming. They think good times are ahead. <laughs> you know, they think the world's getting better because they believe evolution philosophy. It should just really scare you and just think, these people are completely ignorant. And you know what? Down under your feet in the heart of the earth, is a place called hell where the souls go and they're burning down there and they're weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's pitch black. It's a horrible place of torment. And the only time that they get out is for the great white throne judgment, given their eternal body, which I believe is a worm, and then they're sent to the lake of fire forever. Do you believe the book? Are you a fanatic? Are you bearing some fruit? I hope so. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. Here's the third parable of the seed and the sower. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and, at, and, so he, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Um, and again, let me just stop there. I have literally seen gospel tracts that are trodden down. The people will, you know, walk on them. They'll take them. They'll throw them out on the street and whatever else. I've seen that. Verse 6, And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Hey, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Out there. Most people don't hear. Most people don't have time. They're concerned about their mortgage payment and their car payment and, and uh, the stocks that they just seem to be losing some money in the stock market and their investments are going down. And, and I'm not really sure uh, who I'm going to vote for. I think maybe Donald Trump in 2024. And, and uh, you know, um, 
uh, hey, I'm kind of hungry. Can we pull over and get some coffee? Or maybe, do you want to go to McDonald's? I mean, it's not important. What are you doing with the Word of God? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Eh, whatever. Some, some religious fruitcake over there. Yeah. That, that, that house there. Yeah, look at it. Don't look at the signs. Don't. Well, Daddy, the sign said, yeah, don't even worry about that sign. That guy's just some kind of fruitcake or whatever else. I mean, some kind of weirdo, religious fanatic, crackpot. They don't have ears to hear. That's what's going on there. Verse 9. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Um, you can't be saved without this book. I've said that. Well, I'm saved by Jesus, but I don't need the Bible. <laughs> uh, no, um, Jesus is the one who died on the cross, but you can't know that unless you have the written record. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Being born again of, uh, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. This is a living book. This is your connection to God right here, this book. This is the seed that's sown to you. That's why it's so important. And the devil comes along and he says, um, actually, you can't understand that King James Bible. I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll give you an NIV. Or how about a New King James Version? Back here on this banner that Ruckman drew here. How about a New American Standard Version? There's Nestle, there's Alon, there's Hort, Metzger, Bruce Metzger, there's Hegel and the Revised Version and all these good books. They're so much easier to understand than your archaic King James Bible. You see? Um, hey, how about some good videos? How about some entertainment? I mean, why don't you watch some overweight guy playing video games or something like that, going working, you know, walk through for a video game. <laughs> Using the profanity, the F word every couple of, you know, every other sentence or something like that. That's important. That's, you know, going to really look good for you in eternity. You know, I watched every video of some, you know, fat pervert or something on YouTube that plays video games. Wow. Good job. Verse, verse uh, 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy and they have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Huh. You know, it's, uh, they believe. You can believe in vain. Mm -hmm. Watch out for preachers that tell you that salvation is only belief. Watch out for that. You have to ask God to save you. Okay, there's a lot to salvation. It's one event. It can happen whenever you want it to happen. It's an act of your own free will. But it's a lot more than just an intellectual head knowledge. So dangerous. Verse 14 and that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So you see, you can go and you can say, well, you see, in Matthew chapter 13, it says they are unfruitful. You see, that means that they were once producing fruit, but now they've become carnal. See, so they're saved. They're just not fruitful. Compare Scripture with Scripture, brethren. It does not say that in this passage. It says there, bring no fruit to perfection. These people do not have the fruit of the Spirit. There's no proof there. That's why it's so important to inspect fruit and to actually look and say, are you just repeating what you've heard from other people? I've seen that with false converts too. They'll watch some guy's sermon and they'll come out and say, well, the Lord showed me this. Uh, no, actually, you just copied it from somebody else. I mean, there are Hollywood actors out there that can play the Apostle Paul in a movie or some other Bible character or whatever else, and they can quote Scripture. They can learn the lines, and they can seem like they're genuinely interested in salvation or playing this great man of God or something. 
It's fake. It's fraudulent. There has to be fruit that you produce. Not taking from my ministry or from, well, I can talk just like Brian Denlinger and I can wear flannel shirts too and suspenders or something and therefore I'm, I produce fruit. No, you have to do it on your own. You, your unique character, God saved you. You're a unique person in his sight, in his system, and he will produce fruit for you, through you if you're genuinely saved. If you're not saved, you'll not be producing any fruit. Verse 15, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. It reminds me of the passage about the Antichrist, that they come, you know, come out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. It says there, uh, they have, having heard the word, keep it. Well, you know, I used to be into this King James only thing, but then I, tr I converted and I became a traditional Catholic. Um, you were never saved. Well, I was raised in a good King James only Baptist church, but now I'm an atheist. You were never saved. Well, I was once part of the Jack Hiles cult and everything else, and I, you know, I went out and I was soul winner and I did all this other stuff, but you know, I'm a Methodist now or something. You were never saved. It didn't take for you. You keep it. You don't ever give up this book. You look at the differences between the King James Bible and all this other filth down here, and you say, oh, I can't believe that they would take out words and, and, and rely on this Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, and I understand the issue, and wow. Oh, but you know, it, it just got kind of tough to stand for it, and I couldn't find any good King James-only churches in my area, so... I just had to quit and I'm going to some modern church now and I'm reading modern versions and everything else because I just couldn't stand the thought of being alone with Jesus. You wicked devil. Wicked false convert. You hear this in a good heart and you say, wow. The culmination of all those years of Christian suffering, running for their lives and trying to translate this blessed book so I could have this. And then God brings a king and puts him on the throne King James the first. And he says, I'm going to authorize the translation. Gather together all these scholars, the best scholars of England that we have, and I want you to take seven years. He didn't say seven years, but take as long as you need. And they took seven years. Seven is the number of perfection. And they perfected this book and they got it just right. And God used this blessed book more than any other Bible in history. And you get convinced of it and you see it and you, you live this book and you, you say, I'm going to live by this book and you do. And you see the, how people turn against you. And this book brings you comfort. And the fellowship of the Spirit. How many times I've heard from people, I've been thinking about this scripture and I'm just thinking, I wonder if it means this. And that very week, I come out with a sermon on that very issue. Fellowship of the Spirit that we have. And you just take it and you just throw it away. No. True salvation is something that you don't repent of. You don't quit. Well, I shouldn't have bought that car. That was stupid. That thing was a real lemon. I thought it was a good car. Well, I shouldn't have moved to this area. Boy, I can't believe it. We're going to have to move again. And oh, I shouldn't have bought that article of clothing. It just, I thought it, it felt a little funny when I tried it on at the store, but I thought it'll, you know, I'll break it in or whatever else. And it, oh, it was terrible. And I had just finally gave it to Goodwill. And I, you know, oh, I bought that salad dressing and that stuff was horrible and man it, it you regret lots of things in life but you don't regret the bible you don't regret having faith in jesus christ that can't happen if you're genuinely saved i will never ever give up my king james bible ever you will never see king james video ministries is now you know new international version ministries or something <laughs> it's never going to happen I've gone too far. There's no help for me, <laughs> no hope for me to all the papists out there. You know, come back to the church. You know, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'll be very nice. No, that's not going to happen. Matthew chapter 3. Go back there, Matthew chapter 3. It has been my unfortunate uh, experience to have met a lot of people that went back. 
they look back and they say, uh, things are back, better back there in Egypt. I'm not really enjoying wandering around through the wilderness out here. I sure had a good time with the church I used to go to. sure had a good time with those new versions I used to read and whatever else. Goodbye. I'm not going with you. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Hmm. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. It's a bunch of Catholic priests coming. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. Where are the fruits that show me that you've repented? Where's your changed life? Fornicating teenager, and then you went and you, you finally got caught or whatever else, and you said, I better join the priesthood. I'll become celibate or something. And what did that produce? Oh, you don't fornicate openly now. You just, you know mess around with little children in your office or whatever else that come in after the auricular confession and then you have some things to blackmail them with and then you come in and you can touch them and do whatever you want. Filthy perverts. Where are the fruits made for repentance? They don't produce it because false converts can't produce it. Verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed, there, or I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Baptize with water? Washing of water by the word? Hmm. One sows seed, another waters the seed? Do you get it? I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And the Pentecostals, they go, the Holy Ghost fire, you know, the fire will come from that God down upon us and whatever else. Um, no, <laughs> it's two different baptisms there. It's not one baptism. The Holy Ghost comes with fire and whatever else. You say about the, the cloven tongues, of fire in the book of Acts. No, cloven tongues like as a fire. Okay, please understand that. How do you know? Read verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. Remember the separation of the wheat and the chaff? But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Two separate baptisms. Are you producing fruit? Then your wheat. Entered into the joy of the Lord. And here, what do we have left? A bunch of tares. Let's separate the tares and the wheat. How do you separate them? By the fruit that they produce. Not by the profession. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm just carnal. I've just lived in the world all these years and I just, you know, yeah, okay, I watch Hollywood movies and I listen to music and I'm, you know, I look very wicked and I, you know, I've never really done anything for the Lord. And, but I'm saved because I'm a Christian. I say I'm saved. It's not going to work with the Lord. You can fool the people at your uh, local church, but you can't fool the Lord. He's looking for fruit. Real fruit. And if he doesn't find it, it's that axe out chop and down goes that corrupt tree down to be burned I understand that very well you see I burn firewood chop it down not very good 
Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 20. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Seeing they don't perceive, hearing they don't understand. Stop your vehicle. Go to the website out there on that vehicle. Go to the website on the other banner. Go and the salvation message is there. You get into heaven by being led through the scriptures. You have eternity to look for. Oh, 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 I have no time. Broad is the way which leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Such an interesting thing because uh, what do preachers wear? The pastors in these Baptist churches and the pastors in other churches and things, they wear a suit and tie, don't they? You know what suits are made out of? Wool. Sheep's clothing. Hmm. Sheep produce wool. Spun into thread. Made into a suit jacket. Hmm. Verse 16, do, or excuse me, ye shall know them by their fruits. Well, don't be a fruit inspector. Jesus told you to. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. You mean it's possible to bring forth a type of fruit that's actually evil? Uh-oh. A corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Did you know that there's fruit out in the wilds that you don't dare touch? You don't mess with it? Because it's evil fruit. There's a Japanese honeysuckle. Moro's honeysuckle, I think. They shrub honeysuckle. There's another name. There's a bunch of different names for it. And uh, produces these beautiful red berries. Oh, they're so pretty. I've taken pictures of them before I knew what the whole plant was. It's an invasive species. And they produce these beautiful berries. And if you eat one, I don't think I'd want to. You know, I don't know if it gives you a coma or poisons you or just makes you vomit or something. But they're poisonous. It's a corrupt tree and it brings forth evil fruit. And somebody can look at it and say, look, but, but it's producing fruit. Look at that. It has fruit on it. There's beautiful red berries on it. But they're evil. Hey, there's some Christians out there. They're good people. They do a lot of nice things for people. Better than you, Brian. There's people out there that are actually caring for the poor. And they're going out and they're, they're clothing them. And they're feeding them. And they're doing all kinds of nice stuff for people. It's corrupt fruit. It's evil fruit. Verse 18. A good tree bringeth, cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Very interesting. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. You have to judge fruit, brethren. Well, I just don't think it's right. I don't think we should judge people and, and whatever else. You know, If somebody doesn't want to do this or whatever, we shouldn't really have these standards. Standards can actually drive lost people away. I've heard that one too. It's another funny one. Go to Matthew chapter 12. You know... Um, it's this fighting that drives people away. If, if they see Christianity and they see all this infighting, they won't want to get saved. Really? <laughs> okay, well, that's a problem. Do you realize how much infighting Jesus Christ calls when he was on, here on the earth? Actually, he said, I'm come to bring division. <sighs> and you're worried about infighting. Yeah, because a preacher comes out and attacks evil and evil systems and evil movements. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 through 37. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. 
either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. Yes, you can have evil fruit. Yes, you can have corrupt fruit. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know, I just have to say this really quickly about the, the Catholics I've known over the years. I've seen Catholics and, oh, they're such nice people. They're such wonderful and whatever. And just like that, I mean, like that, they'll switch and just profanity and foul language and you know, talk and perverted stuff and whatever else just coming out of their mouth. I've known preachers, Baptist preachers. I've known Methodist preachers. I've known independent Bible preachers and whatever else. And there are two different people. There's the one guy behind the pulpit and then there's the other guy in person. And the guy be in person is, you know, I wouldn't say this in church, but you know, a, did you ever hear about the, the joke about the farmer's daughter and the lonely miner or something? <laughs> you know, I remember I uh, went to a wedding rehearsal for a guy the one time, a friend of mine growing up. And uh, after the wedding rehearsal, we went and the reverend, he's there and went back to their parents' place for this party that they were going to have, you know. And um, while the guy and the girl that were getting married, they were talking about what they should do for their bachelor and their bachelorette party. And they said, are you going to throw some kind of wild, you know, bachelor party? And I said, no. <laughs> and they said, what are you doing afterwards? I said, I'm going home. And I wasn't even saved at the time. I mean, pretty ridiculous. And this reverend's over there and they said, hey, reverend, you want something to drink? alcohol and he said sure i'm not in church i kid you not i'm not in church yeah sure yeah give me something to drink and he's over there just guzzling down the alcohol <laughs> verse 36 but i say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You know, it's going to be a very extra hot place when you get to hell and you realize that you faked your Christianity. You faked being a Bible believer. I mean, <laughs> if I was going to go to hell and I had made up my mind, you know what, I'm going to go to hell, I would be racing cars, I'd be out messing around with as many different women as I could. I'd be doing drugs. I'd be doing just whatever. Live life to the fullest. Why on earth would I fake Christianity? Why on earth would I try to fake the fruit of the Spirit? What a wasted life. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to go to hell, then for goodness sake, don't fake Christianity. Don't fake a belief in the book. Don't mess around with organized religion. Absolutely disgusting. Luke chapter 13. You know, and a lot of people too, a lot of the hyper dispensationalists, they'll say, well, see what Jesus was giving there in the Gospels, that was t doctrinally in the Old Testament, which is true. But um, then, you know, that's just all kind of, Paul kind of came in and said, ah, yeah, Jesus is stuff. Yeah, no, don't worry about that. Um, no, if any man consent not to wholesome words, even the Lord, words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud knowing nothing. Paul wrote that, okay, First Timothy chapter 6. Um, we're to consent to the wholesome words that Jesus Christ said. Jesus Christ gave some concepts in the Gospels that are true in any dispensation at any point in time. A tree is known by its fruit. I've told the story many times. The very first tree that I learned its name was a cherry tree. You know why I learned the name of the cherry tree? A sweet cherry, Prunus avium, if you want to get into the botanical name. You know why I learned that, that tree's name? Because of the fruit that it produced. Going out there in the spring and you see those white blossoms all over that tree. A little while later you look and you see those little green cherries hanging there in clusters. And you go back the next day and you check in you know, on things and my youthful exuberance, I'd go back the same day sometimes hoping that it, they were ripe by then. And, no, you have to wait a few days, <laughs> wait for a week or two here, and they'll be ripe. And the day would finally come, and I'd go there, and oh, there's a red one. Can I eat it? No, it's not ripe yet. Wait till it gets dark you know, purple, kind of a black collar. Um, and I'd come back, and finally the day would be there. And then all summer long, I'd be out there picking 
cherries and things and eating cherries and we'd make cherry jelly and all kinds of stuff from it. The tree was known by its fruit. And I didn't, didn't ever have to worry about going and saying, now, how many of these cherries on here are good for me and how many are poisonous? Well, you know, about one third, one out of every three berries is actually poisonous. The whole tree produced good fruit. And that tree produced an hundredfold, let me tell you. I mean, it was a huge, big tree, and it just produced lots of fruit. I remember climbing up in the tree and just grabbing fruit, you know, and, and just eating cherries. And there's birds in the tree all along with me and things, and they're eating fruit, and there's plenty for everybody. Farmer would go by in his tractor, and he'd go underneath the tree, and he'd reach up, and he'd pick some, and he's eating them, you know, and things. More than enough for everyone. Picture of a good Christian. Never had to worry about that tree. In a good ministry, you won't have to worry about them. Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on the fig, this fig, fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, and till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Um, you say, I just got saved, Brian. I don't know if I'm really producing much fruit. Well, the Lord will do some things in your life to make you produce fruit. Okay? Um, he, will, he will chasten you. He will scourge you. He will cut things out of your life. And he will make things happen. All of a sudden you have your best friend and they call and they say, and they're making some kind of filthy joke. And you say, you know, I really don't appreciate that. I'm a Christian now and whatever. Oh, you know, this thing, this religious stuff of yours is going a little bit too far. I'm getting worried about you. And snip, there goes a friendship. And all of a sudden your uh, <coughs> Christian relatives come along and they, uh, hey, you know what? Uh, we're a little worried about you. This King James only stuff and this, you know, I learned... I heard that you're actually watching Brian Denlinger in this King James video mystery. He's very divisive. He's been exposed many times, and he's false. You know, <laughs> and snip, there goes the family members. It's not that you have to stick with me. I'm just saying, you know, truth that you learn here, if you learn a truth and the Lord confirms it, then you stick by that. You're not sticking by me. You're sticking by the book. There goes some family members. Um... I was listening to this music and I thought it was good, but uh, I can't believe they actually said this horrible thing. Pruning. Cutting off those dead branches that shouldn't be there. The Lord will work on you, in other words. If you're a good tree, He'll do something so that you bring forth some fruit. You say, what happens if I don't? Well, I refuse to bring forth fruit. Then you're going to get cut down because you've been false. I mean, don't you want to change? That's something I just cannot fathom. With all these false preachers out there, false prophets and, prophets and everything, why don't you want to change? Why do you fight preachers like me that say that there needs to be a change in your life? Why do you fight that? I mean, if I had my old life right now, I would be dead. I would have probably not even made it to 40 years old. I used to think that as a lost man. I don't think I'll ever see 40 years old the way I was living. 47, I went seven years beyond what I used to think. Looking out towards the future and saying, oh, the Lord's got all kinds of plans for me. I know He does. I'm glad He changed my life. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 34 through 38. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me, and to finish His work. Say not ye that there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Hmm, that's a pretty good thing. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, that whereon... Ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. I didn't write this book. I'm not one of the translators of the King James Bible, but I'm sure glad that the Lord raised them up. 
They bestowed a lot of labor back then, seven years of work to give me this book, this amazing book. And now I get to do a little bit of reaping. I can reap the rewards of actually having a Bible, the whole Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, in my hands. Do you ever think about that? You know, back in uh, John Wycliffe's day, back in the 14th century, it, you know, people would spend a whole month's wages to receive a page of the New Testament because it was handwritten. <laughs> Gutenberg Press comes along in the 16th century. Let's print these Bibles. Let's get them out there. You want a Bible? You want a Bible? Here's a Bible. There's a Bible. They labored. We can reap. We can sow the Word now. You can take your printer. You can go out and get a printer. Make little tracks. Print, print, print. Print 100 copies. Here you go. 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 You see the uh, picture of the sower with the sow, and he's got his little sack there, and you know, satchel over this way, or the strap over this way, the little satchel thing there, and he's got, he reaches his hand and gets the seeds, and he just dispersing them like that, just throwing them out there. Well, I don't recommend throwing gospel tracts going down the road like that, but the point is, you can get out there, you can get a lot of Word, the Word of God out there. Put it out in strategic areas. It'll never return void, ever. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verse 23 through 26. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Hmm. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. How is God going to honor you? When you follow Jesus Christ, how do you follow Jesus Christ? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground, buried, three days later, he dies on the cross, buried, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Jesus died on the cross, and it brought forth fruit. You have to die as well, brethren. I'm not the same man that I used to be. I died. I'm buried. I have new friends now. I have new acquaintances now. I have new desires in my life. And I want to bring forth fruit. And the Father will honor me as a result of that. I'm a fellow laborer together with him. I can actually get to heaven and say, Lord, I've experienced some Judas Iscariots. I've experienced some Peters. I've experienced some Johns, like disciples. Lord, I know what it's like to have family turn against me. I know what it's like to have the religious leaders mock me and put me down. What a wonderful thing. John chapter 15. Well... Oh, this isn't the positive Christianity that I signed up for. I mean, I thought Christianity was a, a neat thing, and, and I was impressed by the love that these people had for each other. I went to a church, and everybody was hugging, and, and we had really good coffee and donuts, and, and, and it was wonderful. But now I'm hearing about all this doctrinal stuff and all these things, and there's division, and there's fighting, and people called me names. <laughs> you know. I don't think I want this Christianity stuff anymore. They said I can't watch TV and I can't listen to rock music and I'm supposed to dress differently and I'm supposed to act differently. I hate this. I don't want this. <laughs> Times however many billions of people. John chapter 15 verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it. Why? Why would God do that? I mean, I'm trying to preach the word here. Lord, why are you chastening me? Why are you kicking me and things and making me give up more, even more sin as time goes by and help me to feel pain so I have to go through that and I know how to cure it now and all this. Why? What's the purging about? 
Can I eventually get to the point where I just get along with the lost world? No. Why? He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Are you satisfied with 30-fold? Wouldn't you rather have 60-fold or 100-fold of fruit? You say, well, yeah, I'd like to have as much fruit as I can. I'd like to have as many rewards at the judgment seat of Christ as I can, as much millennial inheritance as I can. Then be, pre then be prepared to be purged. <laughs> Verse 3, how does he do it? Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. There's supposed to be a lot of fruit there. Well, I just don't think that you should judge other people's fruit. God's judging your fruit. There's never going to come a point in time when God says, oh, that's enough. You know, no, no. You, you've done enough. That just, you know, get along with the world and talk about the weather. And, you know, just, I don't want people to think you're weird or anything or treat you like you're weird or whatever else. No. John chapter 15 and verse 16. Drop down there in the same chapter. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Again, think about the whole basic premise of this study, of this sermon. There's the third group there, the one that the, the seed is sown, and the cares of the world you know, sown into the thorns, and the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and, and the lust of other things choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Um, how does that line up with a Christian? It doesn't. There's supposed to be fruit there. And if there's not fruit there, the Lord says, okay, I have to purge you a little bit. I have to make some things rough on you so that you'll go back to bearing fruit. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 19 through 23. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Amen to that. We have infirmity in our flesh, the temptation to sin, in other words. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What? Fruit? Had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed... <laughs> I am so ashamed of the false fruit, the evil fruit, the corrupt fruit that I used to, to bear when I was going to modern churches. Oh, I was a holy young man, you know, and oh, look at me. I'm, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm a, I'm a good, you know, young man and everything else. Oh, is that, look at that girl's mini skirt that she has on. Oh boy. In church. I'd like to get rid of these old hymns and bring some of my, you know, Christian rock in here. And I look back at that stuff now and I think, oh God, forgive me for that. Oh man. The fruit that was there in my life, the fruit was evil fruit. I was a good Christian, don't you know? It's terrible. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. My fruit changed. And your fruit changes when you get saved. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen to that. Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 5. Let's read that. 
Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that ye should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So again, all this third group, though, those that it's sowed among thorns and whatever else, they can produce fruit. They're just unfruitful now or whatever. Lost people can produce fruit, and they do produce fruit, but it's corrupt, it's evil, and that fruit leads to death. That's the whole point here. So don't be deceived by this thing of, well, you know, there are carnal Christians out there that, that they just kind of mess around with the world and things and, and whatever, but they, they produce fruit. Well, what kind of fruit is it? I need to inspect it. I mean, when I was a boy, there was Halloween. We would go out to, you know, trick-or-treating and all that other stuff. Very wicked. I was not a saved boy and everything else. But, you know, professing Christian family. We'd go out and we'd do Halloween. We'd go trick-or-treating. And there were stories of people putting razor blades in apples and poison into apples and giving children these poisoned apples. And they were saying, oh, parents, please be careful. Please be warned, you know, whatever else. It should be candy that's in a wrapper and the wrapper shouldn't have any holes in it. Make sure that people aren't giving out apples because, you know, they're putting razor blades in. You see, but it's still good fruit. It's a good fruit, but it's poisoned. It's been tampered with. It will kill you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 through 11. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So, right there, again, there's the thing of a parable of the seed and the sower. If I have sown unto you spiritual things, then please help me to get that seed out there. Help me this ministry to get it out there. Why? To produce more fruit. You see? And you're, in these videos, I mean, you can learn from these videos, write the scriptures down. You can go out there and you can give the scriptures to other people. That's why I don't copyright my, my work or anything. You can take pieces of my video and put them into your videos and things to get certain things out. Great. Praise the Lord. I want to see fruit born. And thank you, of course, to everybody out there that does um, support this ministry financially. I, I always appreciate that. I have to say that. Um, I know people, a lot of people don't want to be thanked individually and personally and things. Some people, you know, send me a donation. They say, hey, you know, just let me know that you got this and I'll do that. That's fine. But uh, I always try to let people know I am very thankful. Thank you. Just to get that out there. I was taught to be polite. That's one thing I, my parents got right. And you thank people when they do something nice for you. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. I preached a sermon on this many years ago. Um, the Bible does not say fruits, plural, of the Spirit. At least the King James Bible. I haven't checked the new ones, the Vatican versions. But it's describing the Holy Spirit being in your life and that there's different uh, characteristics to the fruit of the Spirit. And those characteristics should be there. If it's something that you're doing, you say, was it done in love? Did you have joy doing it? Was there peace about it? Is there some long suffering that goes along with it? Were you gentle? Was there gentleness there? Was there goodness? Are you trying to do good for people? Did you have faith that the Lord is going to use this and bless this? Were you meek about it? Hopefully there's no pride in what you're doing. And there's temperance there. 
moderation. Okay? Against such there is no law. And you know, it's kind of funny. They come out with all these rules and laws, you know, and everything else of trying to persecute Christianity and whatever else. But if you really have the fruit of the Spirit, there's not a whole lot of laws against that. Just out there sowing the word. Hey, don't pass that out here. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see any signs up or anything else. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'll take them back. You know, goodbye. See ya. I've seen some of these soul winning guys and they get into these, you know, almost fist fights with people and angry yelling sessions and whatever else. What a waste of time. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go there. A couple more places to go to. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Hmm. You can get messed up by starting to get into the world. You say, well, see, right there. Thorn and ground here. No, no, no. I didn't. It doesn't say that they didn't produce no fruit. Okay. You have to remember that. You can get messed up. You can start getting into that stuff. You can start to act like you're lost as a saved person. Verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving. You're supposed to prove. You don't just say, well, you know, I don't inspect people's fruit. And whatever. No, you're supposed to prove. The tree is known by his fruit. You have to look into that stuff. And if you see somebody and they're starting to say some things and whatever else, rebuke them. If they get mad at you, if they lose their uh, sanctification that they have, then it's false sanctification. A real Christian, when they're confronted with sin, they won't get angry at you. They'll get under conviction. All the people that have gotten mad at me and called me false prophet and all this other stuff over the years, I know what they are. They're the ones that are false. Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Remember the word? Washing of water by the word. The Bible is just so important. Never forget that. Verse 6, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Hmm. When you hear, hear this book, when you study this book, it will bring forth fruit. Period. It will. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 through 11. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Um, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present uh, seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable, there it is again, 
fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. God chastens, God scourges every son that he receives. And that, of course, includes, you know, mankind is what it's basically talking about there, which includes men and women. Um, if God has received you, he will scourge you. And sometimes you don't want it to happen. I've had that thing happen many times. There are certain people I don't want to let go of. Certain people that I just kind of have a bad feeling about. Kind of a, I think they're false. But I enjoy their fellowship. I enjoy the talks that we have and whatever else. Excuse me. And the Lord says, uh, no, I don't want my good tree being near a corrupt tree. I don't want that uh, bad fruit to start poisoning you. Um, I need to get rid of that. And um, by the way, uh, you did some stupid things, so uh, here you go. Wham. <laughs> There's some ways that I need you to turn. And you're a little bit too thick-headed up here, so I'm going to have to hit you a little bit harder this time. Any scourges, any chastens. And why? Because he wants to, me to bear more fruit. You know, it's an amazing thing. God not only saves you, but God will chasten you so that you actually have more rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1 verse 10. Speaking about evil beasts, brute beasts, false converts, the people that God said when he was here on the earth, the Lord said, I, I don't want them to hear and understand be, lest they be converted and their sins be forgiven. <laughs> these people, I don't care about these people. Their ears are dull. They just, I don't know, I don't need to hear that. They've heard the gospel presented. They walk past and they see the scriptures and they just go, <sighs> brute beasts. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran, ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about with winds, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit. You see that? Twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Hmm. Their fruit withers without fruit. Hmm. The fake fruit the evil fruit, fruit, the corrupt fruit that they put on as a show to make themselves look like a genuine convert, it withers and it goes away. And the professions that they've made, the things that they say, they change and they go back to the world. And the Lord looks at them and says, you're a beast. And it's kind of interesting because there's a man coming in the future that's called the beast. And he gives his Servants, a mark of the beast. Hmm. Very interesting. Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22. Verses 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And that's where we're going to end it. My next sermon is actually going to be on the city of New Jerusalem. But uh, I hope that this sermon really straightens some things out in your mind and that you will not be confused over the thing of false converts. Um, <laughs> we are at the very end of this time where the body of Christ is and the church of Jesus Christ. 
And the devil has been so busy creating so many false churches, so many false converts. It just boggles the mind. And how many times I've been out in public and, oh, I like your bumper stickers. And I say, oh, are you born again? Uh, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, and I, and I just take a look and I think, okay, they're kind of worldly looking. Well, you know, I, and I try to make excuses for it. And, and they say, oh, where do you go to church? And I think, and I say, well, I, actually, I follow the Bible principle. I don't go to a church building. I, I worship the Lord at home. And they go, Oh, okay. Well, um, hey, if you never like to come to church, I'm, I'm going over to such and such Baptist church and we'd love to have you on Sunday morning. And blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, I'm inspecting the fruit here and it smells kind of a little bit rotten. And uh, okay, uh, you know, it's not that I don't want them to be saved. You see, it's not that I don't want to be around you know, I, any, nobody else out there. I'm the only one who's saved and I don't want anybody else to be saved. I want everybody to be saved. You know, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I feel the same way. I'd like to see, I'd like to see a traffic pile up out here and have every single person get out of their vehicles and walk over and read these signs and say, what must we do to be saved? I would love that, but they don't. And the mark of the beast is coming. They just, they're just they just testing the uh, central bank digital currency. Americans have lost $9 trillion on the stock market the last few months. We're in the end times like the Bible prophesied. Repent and be saved. What a nut. <laughs> Driving a vehicle they can barely afford. Back to a house they can barely afford. All this other stuff, I just think. <laughs> you know what I mean. You know what I mean. The letters I get. Family rejection of you. and Marriages breaking up. Friends stabbing you in the back. Possibly losing your job. Sickness failing you or sickness, your health is failing you. And, and uh, what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about that? Well, be open to the Lord's scourging, the Lord's chastening and say, okay, Lord, if I have to go through this thing, how can I produce some more fruit? How can I get the seed out there more? Lord, is there some way I can sow this blessed book of yours? Is there some way I can get more of this out there? Some kind of, boy, I'd sure like to be able to sow some seed. I want to bring forth fruit, Lord. I, I'm not satisfied with 30. I'm not satisfied with 60. I want 100. I want to be the, a giant tree that the branches go way out like that and just sagging with the weight of the fruit. You know that fruit tree that I grew up with? That thing, it had so much fruit on it that a big storm blew up and all the weight of that fruit on the branches and it was blowing and everything else, and that tree just went and broke in half. And inside that tree, there was a bunch of ants that were eating that tree from the inside. And all the weight and everything else in the center was rotting out and everything, that tree didn't have a chance. But it was there up until the time I was a teenager. For years and years, that tree produced fruit. And it was there long before me. It's probably, you know, 150, 200 year old tree. It was a huge, big tree. You know what's interesting? I still have some of the wood of that tree. I go like this. It's stored over in that, that way. I still have some of the wood of that tree. And you know something? When you work with that wood, it smells like fresh cherries. That tree produced so much fruit that literally the juices of the fruit impregnated the wood and it just smells like fresh cherries. It smells so good when you work with that wood. That tree left a legacy. I'll never forget that tree. I want to be like that tree, and I hope you do too. That's going to be it for this study. Um, <laughs> I wish I could tell you that everybody that says they're a Christian is a Christian, but uh, you know better if you've been saved. Um, there are a lot of false converts, brethren, lots of them, and they don't understand what's going on in this world. There's just no spirit of discernment there. They don't have the fruit of the Spirit, in other words. Um, be not partakers with them. Get away from them. Um, 
you want to be by yourself as a tree in terms of your relationship with the Lord. You have to have that personal relationship. And it doesn't matter what other trees do around you. Hopefully there's some good trees in the uh, forest where you're at. <laughs> some other good trees around you. Hopefully you're married to one or have relatives or somebody out there to support you. Um, but if you say, brother, I'm alone. I'm the only tree. I'm out here in a field all by myself. And I'm getting hit with the wind and the rain and the lightning. You know, hopefully lightning's not hitting you. But, <laughs> but what you understand what I'm saying here, speaking symbolically, um, it can get rough. It can get very rough, but stand, stand firm. And when the day comes when you finally go down or get called up, hopefully, when the day comes that you finally go down, I hope that there's a testimony and people say, I remember that tree. They produced fruit. Well, it was on their vehicles. They'd wear it on their shirt. They had a hat, scripture on it, their house, scripture, 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 scripture. You go to the store and, oh, there's the track. So there's it. Old so-and-so, he was here again. Yeah, just scripture all over the place, just making sure that we know what the Bible says. Oh, yeah. Oh, hi. Yes. I, no, I don't need a Bible. You know, whatever. Yeah, there's that guy. He's always trying to give Bibles to people and things, whatever else. It's one of those Bible thumpers, I guess, or something. Hopefully that's your testimony. So that's going to be it, and uh, hopefully this has been a challenge. So we will see you in the next video, and as always, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your friendship, and I'm sure looking forward to going to heaven and being with my brothers and sisters in Christ. We can get ditch this rotten, cruel world. <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. So we will see you in the next video.